good. <laughs> All right, everybody, please do take a seat. We're about to get started uh, to wonderful musical accompaniment. I hope you can hear us. Uh, welcome to this event, uh, Savings and Later Life. How can we avoid a future cost of living crisis uh, from conservative home in partnership with Royal London. My name is Rachel Wolf. I'm a semi-regular contributor to Conservative Home and often uh, chair their brilliant conference events. And I'm delighted to welcome our panel uh, in reverse order of their arrival. Um, uh, Guy Opperman, MP, former Pensions Minister. Guy has been Member of Parliament for Hexham since 2010. Uh, and then to my left, Richard Holden, Member of Parliament for Northwest uh, Durham and erstwhile SPAD for large numbers of government departments. And then finally, uh, Barry O'Dwyer, Group Chief Executive Officer of Royal London, the UK's largest mutual life insurance and pension company. Um, I'm going to suggest that uh, each of our panelists in that order kick off with a few remarks on the um, subject of the event, but I'm sure you'll all be aware that pensions have never been more interesting. Uh, so if you want to ask some broader questions about what on earth is going on in the economy right now and what that has to do with savings, interest rates, and pensions, please be my guest. So I'm going to ask each of our panel panelists to speak for three to five minutes. Uh, I may then ask a couple of questions, and then I will open up to the panel. Before I do, can everyone hear me over the noise? Yes, wonderful. Okay. Uh, final housekeeping thing. This is being live streamed, so if you don't want anyone to know your question, don't ask it. And over to Guy. Wow. Okay. So I'm going to try and stand up and chat on the mic as well. So my name is Guy Opperman. I am the MP for Hexham. Can you hear me all right? A bit. I've got to sit down. Okay. It's too much. So, all right. Is that better? So. I'm the MP for Hexham. I am a former pensions minister. Uh, was very much the case that um, did that for five years, was a government whip and was in Treasury for a while. And uh, very supportive of the principle of what uh, Conhome and this particular event is trying to do. I'm going to give three policy suggestions, which is the first and foremost is, and I'll take any questions on pensioning matters that, and pass them over to Richard Holden at a later stage. Um, but the first would be this, is that if you want to address long-term savings and cost of living, you have to come up with policy suggestions to address those particular things. And there are three things. The one would be mandatory 1% savings, what I call rainy day funds. The second would be a thing called the midlife MOT and the transformation that happens in respect of those of us who are midlife. And midlife, for most of us, happens at 47 that's when you take into account your wealth, work, and well-being and your long-term retirement prospects and also what money you need to survive and thrive on a long-term basis. And thirdly, I want to change the pay structure of almost every business in this country. And crucially, I believe if you do that, your talent pool will be retained on a long-term basis. How do you do that? Right. So the first is your 1% savings. In my view, you have a mandatory uh, offer, just like you have with auto-enrolled pensions, of 1% savings to all of your employees. They can opt out of that, but the beauty is they would end up with a proper rainy day fund on a long-term basis. Uh, it is totally easy to do. The payroll companies could do it in a heartbeat, not a problem at all. The second is in terms of the midlife MOT. You need to look at wealth, work, and well-being. There is a DWP trial that's ongoing at the present stage. And crucially, everybody thinks they have more money to retire upon than they do. They don't. Everybody doesn't go and speak to their GP as they should do. And more particularly, they don't retrain in the way that we really ought to do so. All of those three things can be addressed on a long-term, very specific basis. And the third one is in respect of changing pay structures. Most big companies will pay somewhere between 20 to 40,000 uh, pounds for new graduates, new, in, new starters. But then they'll, they'll also then say is we'll pay you a pension and we'll probably pay a bit on top of the automatic enrollment 8%. I don't think they should. What they should do is they should offer a savings package that basically says to the individual, if you stick with us for six months, we will have you savings to buy a car. If you stick with us for two years, you'll have the savings for a deposit to buy a house. 
Those are the things that are motivating young people right now. And if you have, meet any under 30 year old, that's the two things they're interested in. The ability to get out and about and the ability to have a home of their own. And they much prefer to have an 8% pension but a 5 to 7% top up savings pot that they can then dip into than a 15% pension that they're not going to touch for the next 40 years. It transforms talent pool, it retains your staff, and is genuinely transformational. The businesses that are doing it are knocking spots off every other person for recruitment. And I'll stop there. Uh, thank you, Guy. I'm going to ask you one question before we move on. Uh, so your first policy proposal obviously puts less money in people's pockets right now in the midst of a cost of living crisis. So no, it doesn't. 1% savings? Yeah. If they've still got the money, it just happens to be saved. And they can access it at any yes, time? Yes, at any time. Then my second question is uh, your second set of policies, as I understand it, uh, rely on the state in terms of GP access retraining to be available. The rumors are we're entering a period of serious public spending constraint. How is that feasible? So you need to read the Aviva trial where they did it for £25 per employee. It's very good for businesses. They retain their employees. There are also 10 LEP trials uh, that took place and, again, are published by DWP. It is totally self-financing. And, by the way, you can already get your one-year full uh, GP appointment under the state at the present stage. That's not going to end. Your lifelong learning comes through the Orga report and various other things. And, in truth, a... a uh, wealth management assessment, obviously you can go to some of the very esteemed pension providers here who will give you a wealth management assessment, but you can do that yourself online and there are various organizations from the Money and Pension Service to various other things, online tools that will do this. You don't actually need the state to step in and many companies are doing it already. I have more questions, but I'm going to move on. Thank you. Okay. Um, Barry, over to you. Okay, thank you. Um, I suppose... Everybody's focus is on the cost of living crisis, so uh, politicians, uh, policymakers, and, and uh, private sector um, companies like Royal London. And that's right, but it doesn't mean that we shouldn't be also thinking about long-term savings at the same time. In fact, you know, the two aren't mutually exclusive, and in fact I'd argue that we should always have an eye on uh, long-term savings, no matter what's going on in the economy. Um, there's a, there's, our policy paper is somewhere in the room. You, you uh, can pick one up on the way out. But um, it covers things like uh, recent estimates from the DWP are, suggest that 12 million people are under saving for retirement. Um, now, it would have been a lot worse. It would have been about 40 million people, according to the DWP analysis, if auto-enrollment auto hadn't happened. And, of course, auto-enrollment has been by anybody's measure, a tremendous success. But we, we still are in a position where um, a large number of people are under saving for retirement. So it, we have to tackle this at some point. Taking money out of people's pay packets now to divert into pensions is obviously um, not really tenable in the short term, but we need to have a long-term plan for getting to the levels of pension contribution that are going to mean that people have the standard of living that they expect in retirement. So this is really a long-term um, process and a long-term program for uh, this government and for, uh, for successive governments to invest in. Um, I suppose that's where I'd leave it in terms of opening remarks and then I'm happy to take questions. Uh, I have one question. Um, so uh, I think both political parties are starting to turn their mind to manifesto commitments and that's normally where you get long-term reform. So as the first stage in this journey, what would you most want to see a commitment to in the party's next platforms? Uh, without stealing thunder of, my, of the next speaker, I think uh, the, the implementation of the 2017 auto-enrollment um, uh, review, uh, which, which Mark will talk about, but, the, um, but I think just building on what I was just saying about uh, thinking, uh, thinking ahead to how we might progressively increase the contribution rate into pensions. Uh, if you look at, at probably the, the country that's used always as the example of how to do this is Australia. And the way that, that they did it in Australia uh, is different to, it's different to the UK because they had collective bargaining on wages. But essentially, um, the Australian government expressed a preference for employers to increase pension contribution rather than pay, to pay wage rises because wage rises are inflationary. And I think if you, if you think ahead over the next few years in the UK, that might be uh, an area that we could explore where, whereby the transfer of value from employers to employees 
takes place via pension schemes rather than um, risking entrenching inflation by paying it in, in terms of wage settlements. Thank you. And uh, last but not least, Richard. Uh, thanks a lot, Rachel. Uh, well, it's nice to be riding on the wave of applause already from those outside. So uh, it's... Uh, and uh, I just want to actually build quite a lot upon what uh, Guy said. Guy's going into a few more details than, uh, on his broader ideas, but I'll probably stick to the main uh, theme of what I've been pushing with my um, private members' bills recently, um, <clears throat> which is basically to expand auto-enrolment in three areas. One, to reduce the age at which it kicks in to 18 or even below, because at the moment it only kicks in at 22, so it seems to be a pretty graduate targeted policy rather than targeted to the workers in my constituency, 75% of whom start work at age 18. Uh, secondly, increase it so that part-time workers can uh, get more involved because they don't often uh, hit the trigger points at the moment. And thirdly, that lower paid workers across the board would get over time, would get more, and this would be phased in over a long period of time. Now, the government pushback has been uh, a bit like that old prayer of St. Augustine. You know, Lord, please make me be good, but just not quite yet, because nobody wants to... Uh, they're worried it about... chastity, taking... wasn't it, rather than good? Well, just... I decided to clean it up for this uh, Conservative home audience. <laughs> um, the, uh, but this, is, this has been the sort of response of the government today. But the truth is that the quicker we get this stuff on the statute books, the quicker we get it moving, uh, the more good we can do um, more quickly. And um, you can see the starkness of the stats, basically, at the moment. You've got about 20% of young people under the age of 22 who are paying into their pension pots. That rises to 86.4% of full-time workers, around 80% of those over the age of 22. 58% uh, of part-time workers are, whereas obviously you're seeing 80% of, 6% of full-time workers. And on, for somebody who's got two part-time jobs at the moment, which are currently slightly under the threshold at which they get enrolled, uh, versus somebody uh, working similar, similar job full-time, that difference is around £300,000 in lifetime savings. So that's the difference between somebody able to having a comfortable retirement, maybe even provide a couple of deposits for uh, kids and that sort of thing, uh, versus basically relying just on the state pension. So it seems a pretty clear thing we should do and something we could bring in uh, relatively quickly. Obviously, we've seen how... Uh, I would like to see the, uh, the, the actual... Uh, uh, amounts increased over time, but I think the important thing now is to expand it so that all workers are covered, so that everybody feels like they're benefiting. And I think at the moment, one of the reasons we should look at doing this as a political party now is um, some, some people might have said a few weeks ago to me, ministers, when I kept raising this with them, that, well, pensions are really boring and nobody really talks about them. I think if you went to my local pub with me and Connor from my staff last week, people were definitely talking to you about their pensions. And uh, so I think this is something where people actually do have a real long-term interest in talking about. I think it's something we could do to help uh, restore trust in the government in terms of uh, they're looking out for our long-term interests. Uh, and also something which would help us uh, in a broader area which the government wants to look at, which is around uh, supply-side reform, if, especially if you can align it to some of those Solvency II changes uh, to enable pension funds to look at perhaps longer-term investments in more illiquid assets, particularly uh, in communities so you can get some private sector cash into uh, essentially that levelling up space as well. So um, that's why I'm keen on pushing and will continue to do so and hopefully with the support of the former pensions minister from the back benches. Um, and Richard just explain to me a bit more is the reason the government hasn't done this because it's not high enough up the priority list or is there a political cost in their mind and if so how do they get over it? Well I, I genuinely can't see the political cost in a, 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 you've got a situation at the moment where somebody on my salary gets tax relief uh, for, uh, and is essentially auto-enrolled. Even if I was in the private sector job, I'd be auto-enrolled. Um, whereas somebody in my constituency who's 20 years old, two years into a degree-level apprenticeship, isn't auto-enrolled, uh, or who's been working full-time for a couple of years, it seems to me totally iniquitous and just with political upside to actually expand it. Uh, I think it's more a case of they're a bit worried. I think this is a general case of is this something which should be high at the priority list? Is something that people really care about? And uh, I think it is. I think it's one of those things along with housing, childcare, pensions, um, you know, social care. These are things that people want the government to have their long-term interests at heart on. 
and uh, I think there's, it's something that they would actually welcome. Um, it's just, it's just the, where is the political will to do it. Thank you. I'm going to open up to questions. Um, given the noise, I think there should be mics that are going round. If you can put up your hand if you wish to answer, ask a question. Uh, the gentleman here in... Have you brought a kazoo class. or a guitar? <laughs> please join in. And if we go straight to the gentleman next to him, that would be great. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Nicholas Beale, is one of the ways we can address this making it easier for pension funds, you, you touched on this, to invest in assets which have higher long-term returns and also higher real economic returns? We've over-regulated these funds so that they stick in gilts well, fine, but gilts have almost, have almost no interest and they don't really do very much for the growth of the country as a whole compared to in the States where they have much bigger allocations into innovation, science and technology scale-ups and all the things that make the economy move forward. Thank you. Um, two quick ones. Should the government introduce pension tax relief? Um, and there was it a already has. Lots of it. Okay. Keep going. Sorry, there, there was rumours they were putting in policies um, in terms of reforming the pensions lifetime allowance about two weeks ago. Okay. They haven't announced that yet publicly, but are you in favour of that panel? Um, and there was a Work and Pensions Committee paper on Friday which suggested the government should increase the auto enrolment uh, pensions contribution to 12% and employee contributions to 5 Are you supportive of that? Uh, thank you. So first the question on um, pension funds. Uh, when I was in Downing Street seven years ago, everyone was talking about the fact that our pension funds didn't invest the way the US ones did or the Canadian ones did. It feels like it was a sort of eternal debate. Um, I'll go to you, Barry, first if I can. Is that fair? How could the government incentivize it? And, and how, if, if that's relevant, could the sector change? Yeah, it is, Nicholas. It's absolutely fair. In fact, there are two big elements of the pensions industry. So there's defined benefit pensions, which are the old final salary pension schemes that um, increasingly our parents enjoyed, uh, and they're closed essentially to new entrants, but they're still a major force in the economy. There's about 1.7 trillion pounds invested in defined benefit pension schemes. They largely are invested in bonds, uh, either government bonds or high-grade investment bonds. Um, and you saw some of the impact of that during the week in, uh, in what happened in markets. Um, they're increasingly also moving to insurance companies because they're, uh, basically every employer is desperate to get them to buy out, what's called buy out, so, so fund them sufficiently so that the liabilities can be handed over to an insurance company. When the insurance company takes on those liabilities, they then invest in exactly the same way. Um, and that's required under uh, European re legislation called Solvency II, which you may have heard of in the, uh, in the leadership debates. Uh, we in the insurance industry are quite keen to see a reform of Solvency II uh, exactly to deliver the sort of change in investment behavior that, uh, that you're talking about. It is pretty restrictive just now in that the penalty in terms of additional capital for an insurance company if in moving away from those high-grade assets is pretty penal. So uh, the legislation needs to change, but it is on the government's uh, to-do list, I'm, I'm certain. Then there's about half a billion pounds and growing in defined contribution pension schemes. So these are the schemes that, that everybody's being um, auto automatically enrolled into in the workplace at the moment. That's the future of pensions. That's, that will eventually uh, overtake DB pensions. We have work to do on that side as well because what happens in those schemes is that they're run by trustees or by insurance companies who take a very cautious view in terms of um, what goes into the default fund. There's a huge focus on price. Uh, over the last 20 years governments and regulators have convinced themselves that uh, controlling price was the most important thing and as a result what hap there's this Focus on price leads to um, passive public market funds being used in, in default funds. Now, the logic of, from that is to say, well, if members don't like it, they can switch out and invest in something more exotic. But the reality is 95% of members stay in the default. So what we have to do is fix the default. And I think uh, one of the things that, that we're talking to government about, is, is there a way in which we could mandate some investment in the default uh, have a, a more sensible structure than we have now and say that a, a small proportion of every default fund 
is invested in the build of infrastructure or some illiquid UK-based asset that will actually drive the wider economy forward as well as generate uh, good long-term returns for members. Uh, Guy, what's your view on this? So I'm going to choose my words carefully because uh, unlike my predecessors uh, who occupied the position of pensions minister, I don't want to pile in and tell my successor uh, just how, if only I was running it, it would be done better. Um, because that's, in my view, a completely shit's way of doing it. So I'll try and answer the questions in a broad but terms, but I do know quite a lot about the three issues raised. So first of all, on illiquids, can, what, what you're describing is illiquid investment in infrastructure projects. Can the government do lots more? Yes, they can do lots, lots more, without a shadow of a doubt. And there are various suggestions, and there is a lot of work being done already prior to the leadership change, and certainly I commissioned a huge amount of work, on trying to ensure that both DB and DC, defined benefit and defined contribution pensions, are allocated to uh, UK infrastructure and investing for net zero as well. That work can do more. There is a thing called the long-term asset fund, which is just not doing well enough. There is a lot more that you could do. I would make a couple of uh, outlined suggestions. You could, as has been outlined, you could have a minimum percentage on a comply or explain basis. So in other words, you invest 10 to 20% in UK long-term infrastructure or explain why it is you're not going to do that. There's a good easy example on that, which is when Corbyn was at Labour, nobody would invest in housing because everyone thought he was going to nationalise housing and uh, there would be a whole point on uh, investment in housing was just a non-starter. You could also do some tax breaks on such investments, for particularly for uh, key worker housing. You could do lots of great stuff. It does require Treasury, though, to move, and it requires the Prime Minister, Number 10, and Treasury to put the shoulder to the wheel on this. The second is you could incentivize action by taking 10 to 20 percent stakes through government. Nuclear is a great example. We do not build nuclear power stations. The main reason is we leave it entirely to the market, and the market simply can't do it. If, however, you create a structure where pension funds can invest in nuclear in a partnership with the market and with um, the government, then you're in a way different ballgame. And again, that's doable, to be fair to the Prime Minister Boris Johnson. That's pretty much what he signed off on the, literally his last day of being a Prime Minister. Um, I misheard the gentleman because of the noise. I thought he was asking, do the government give pensions tax relief? I don't think you were. So the answer is, we do give pensions tax relief. Am I aware of any changes coming to that? No, not whatsoever at all. Um, but that's way above my pay grade. You're, you should be speaking to a government minister, ideally someone from the Treasury, probably Richard Fuller, who I left at 4 o'clock in ro Executive Room 1, where he's speaking. So if you race up there, you will find him. You can say to him, you're the HMRC minister. Surely you've been consulted about anything on pensions tax relief. Um, in terms of uh, the second question on 12% uh, automatic enrolment, I, I take the first view, which is I'd really like to get... Uh, progress on Richard Holden's uh, automatic enrolment uh, private members bill and also to commit to the 2017 uh, automatic enrolment review, one of the authors which is sitting in the front, pay, front row. Uh, those are the projects you need to do first. There is clearly, it, you know, the, it's a really simple question, will this country copy Australia and have 12% automatic enrolment defined contribution pensions within 10 years? The answer is definitely yes. It just requires government to frankly drive it forward. But unquestionably, that's where we're going. I disagree with the way in which uh, the Australians have done it, but there's a variety of ways. You can do a part employee, part employer uh, contribution basis, and it's very doable, though. And Richard? Um, so a couple of things. Uh, I think, uh, Nick, I think you were asking about um, diversification. I look, I'm all in favor of that. It's, I think it's absolutely crucial actually to get buy-in, especially from, I think of my constituents, lower-paid workers, if they could see that money actually being invested by pension funds locally, it would actually help drive a take-up and people uh, ensuring that they were in auto-enrollment. One of the things I'm particularly keen on is lending to uh, social housing providers, anything which can be done in that space, especially if they have a right to buy, responsibility to build policy, um, which would uh, also expand housing stock in local areas. I think anything which tied in local savings, local investment, local community into building would be incredibly important and also tick another of those big boxes when people are talking about long-term things regarding their, uh, life, uh, their lives. Uh, I agree with, totally with Guy on expanding auto-enrollment first to more people, 
uh, before we increase the rates. I think you'd, you'd see a higher dropout when you do finally expand it to younger people and low -time, low, uh, part time workers if you had the rates being much higher when you, they initially kicked in. Uh, much better get everybody in from uh, the start on it. Uh, and on lifetime allowance, um, I think they're going to have to look at this in some uh, regards because it's a massive impact. Uh, I know it's not quite in the same way, but on uh, I've got so many public sector workers on pretty good pensions, particularly doctors, who are, uh, you know, they're working three days a week because they're paying you know, marginal rates of tax in excess of 80%. So they're just, they're just, they're just not going to do it unless uh, we tackle some of those pinch points. And that, that there are other pinch points in the income tax system as well which really drive that. So uh, I'd be looking to address those pinch points which affect productivity of people. We've literally, in some cases, paid hundreds of thousands of pounds to train and are now working three days a week because we make it tax inefficient for them to uh, work uh, full time. Yeah, and so I'll, I can talk about one thing about pensions, which wasn't my brief, which is great. So local government pensions are run by DCLG or whatever DLUC is now called. Um, and so consequently, I wasn't in charge of them. However, there is a massive thing that they could do. So every single one of us has a local authority. Every local authority has a very significant pension fund. You could do what Cambridge and counties do. That's the district... Uh, Council of Cambridge, which is they took the capital reserve of the Cambridge Pension Fund and they used it for asset-backed lending for investment to the local area. Uh, utterly standard stuff. The Sparkassen in Germany would do this all the time. Uh, it is transformational and all the development that you see in and around Cambridge is done on that basis. Your present local authority does not do this. Trust me, they are immensely passive uh, they don't drive this forward. And the reason why it would really matter is because we all know that we have nurses in our local hospital who cannot get housing. We all know that there is no social housing in as much as we would like because we are reliant on a very, very, very simple system without pension funds getting into this space. Now, they could get into this space if local authorities genuinely uh, were incentivizing them and or partnering up with them. Legal and general, to be fair, are doing very good work on this, but it's really simple. I want uh, an idea where my local authority takes some land and says, well, this will be for key worker housing. This will be for farmers, for nurses who can't necessarily get to work and also do a two-hour travel, particularly in the southeast and in the urban conurbations. And they can utilize, hypothetically, one acre of their car park to actually create starter homes. There is so much they could be doing. They should also be doing, obviously, social housing. The model is there. It's utterly doable. Uh, you just need to drive it forward and you need to incentivize people. And government could drive it as well. Thank you. More questions. One gentleman at the back there and one gentleman here. Thank the you ladies would be good. Thank you very much. Sam Bruce uh, from the Centre for Social Justice. Um, on the question of um, pension fund investment into social housing, um, are there things that could be done to uh, in unlock some of that local authority um, pension capital when many of them are hesitant because they see a, a, um, a prime, they, they recognize their primary goal to um, get the return on the pension and not to um, break their fiduciary duty to give that uh, return on the pension back. Are there policy instruments that we could use to unlock that more effectively? And the gentleman here. Um, hello. Um, I just want to ask about one question that, do you know that on Monday about the British power against the dollar is just so low because of the economic policy from church? And then the thing is that for now it's temporary bounce back, so I don't want to know it is. In one thing, like if investors that if they can worry about the future about the pounds and also does it affect about the cost of living crisis and how exactly will it affect in the future and also about how can we tackle tackle about that one because once the British power falls, everything's going to they're not going to be good. Like inflation going up as well, and so stagflation is going up as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so uh, I know guys are eager to take the first question first. Can I add something to it, which is the government's yeah. talked a lot about um, investment zones as a big part of their growth plan and freeing up local areas in as yet not particularly defined ways. Um, is that one way in which you could achieve what you're talking about? Uh, unquestionably. So. Um, let me answer Sam's question and also your question as one. So 
this happens already. So th there are two bits to it. So can a local authority invest in a particular way and not breach fiduciary duty? Absolutely do. Of course they can. Because what they're trying to do is they're doing nothing different from what a housing association does, which invests for a return on a long-term basis. And by the way, private sector funds do this already. They have property portfolios. They invest that. So their trustees can do it. But I'd go even further because, and this touches on Rachel's point on investment zones. So at the present stage, if I get a city deal, so I'm quite old, so I date back to the May government and the Johnson government when city deals were the way in which government gave cash to community areas through effectively mayors in particular, but also to local authorities to then stimulate investment in that area. What tended to happen is with the city deals, you get a chunk of cash and then and land, and the local authority would sell it to the highest bidder. And when you sell land for property, what tends to happen is that the person who pays most builds worst, right? Which is why Barclay and Persimmon are such useless builders, in my personal opinion, um, because they pay high value, but they produce poor product. What you should do, though, is if you sell to pension funds, they, they are the only people building to net zero, and you can actually structure the way the city deal or investment zone is uh, catered so that a portion of the land and the assets that is taken out is built for the long term, which means you don't necessarily take the highest price to start with, but you get a much better outcome on a long term basis. Now, that's all about DLAC officials and previously DCLG officials structuring the level of the deal so that people sign up to it in a particular way, knowing that that's the structure they're going to do. Utterly doable. Um, I would personally make sure any investment zone has a portion of land that is allocated to pension fund investment first. If they can't then take it up, fine, it can go to anybody. But you should do that first. They've got way more money than everybody else, trust me. All right, um, Barry, I'm going to come to you next. Um, uh, do address that, but also what I think was uh, your question, which is uh, long-term investment requires confidence, and the last few days have been... Um, somewhat frightening for most of the people in this country. Uh, what does that mean? Okay, the, um, just briefly on the first question first. The, the, I think we should be more ambitious than just freeing up the local authority pension schemes, and, and actually very similar to what uh, Guy was saying. Um, this, this idea that you should be able to ring fence a portion of um, default funds to invest, one of the areas that that, that money might be pointed to is exactly to investment zones. Um, for me, you know, you, you have to be careful. I think everybody should be instinctively uh, nervous about the government telling people where to invest their pension money. Um, however, if it is in a default fund and the member always has the opportunity to opt out and invest elsewhere if they don't like it, then I think it's perfectly legitimate for the government to say, well, this is, the, this is where we would like to see this passive money being directed, passive being you know, people going in there and choosing not to make an investment decision. Um, so, th so that's on the first question. On, on the, I mean, it, we, we've had a tough week, but if you look at what's happened to um, Sterling, it's back to where it was before the mini budget. So there, there is, this has been a long-term, well, a reasonably long-term decline uh, in terms of the, uh, over the course of 2022, and, and not just in currents uh, in Sterling, uh, the yen has has. Um, uh, has devalued just as much against the dollar as sterling and some other Swedish krona has done even worse. So it's, it, it is a function of the fact that the, the, the world is an unsafe and an uncertain place just now and uh, the dollar is the safe haven currency of international investors. And so you're seeing, um, uh, bluntly, you're seeing American investors thinking why on earth would they invest in Europe um, because of everything that's happening in Europe at, at the moment. and, and and you've got to be able to understand that point of view. I think that obviously we saw some specific stuff associated with the, um, the budget, but uh, the intervention of the Bank of England has stabilized things for pension funds. I think we're back now to a situation where we're looking at the long-term trends that have been driving uh, UK competitiveness or UK um, attractive, attractiveness to international investors. But just, just to push on that a bit, if I may, um, a lot of the questions here have been about um, long-term investment, both on the side of pension funds, but also government and local authority. Mm -hmm. and, and that generally requires a degree of certainty and confidence. What do you think are the most important things the government could do over the next two years to inspire that level of certainty and confidence? 
Um, the danger of, uh, of straying into political territory. I think everybody uh, recognizes that uh, communication, in fact, the Prime Minister was talking about it this morning, communication with the market could have been better uh, around the mini budget. And I think it's, um, it's exactly right. If you're asking the pension funds, as the government is, to, um, to essentially buy their debt, uh, and increasingly to buy their debt, given that the Bank of England isn't supposed to be buying any more debt, uh, has moved from quantitative easing to quantitative tightening. So the, those people have to be confident that the government is going to be able to pay their bills in 30 or 40 years' time. And, and that's really what happened. The, the fact that, that um, the budget wasn't accompanied by, uh, first of all, had some surprise tax um, giveaways that were unfunded, and then wasn't accompanied by a plan to, to cover those. Um, I think uh, it sounds like the government has heard and is putting that right. But, uh, but I think that's fundamental to creating the long-term stability and predictability that pension funds need. Does the, can I just ask a question? Do you think that the Bank of England has to act again on the 14th of October, or is that a once-and-done fix? I think it's going to be challenging for the Bank of England not to act if, um, uh, in the absence of anything else because there's, there's nothing obvious that's going to happen by the 14th of October that will, uh, will fix the long end of the yield curve. Um, it, you know, the intervention by the Bank of England during the week uh, essentially shored up prices at, uh, of long data government bonds. Um, so something else is going to have to happen before the 14th of October to, me to mean that that support is unnecessary. Uh, Richard, you can choose which of the various comments you want. To yeah, no, no. Well, I, should, I, I might as well. I might as well jump in because Barry has been uh, very, uh, I think, been very fair to the government on this. I think the communication with the market is a bit of a broader issue than just simply the comms of it. The, 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 the markets need to know where the long-term plan is for the, you know, the government to reduce the size of its debt pool or certainly its long-term borrowing. That's what the that's what the markets need to be communicated to it. Um, whether or not that can be done by the 14th of October, Guy, um, we'll have to see. Um, um, in terms of, um, uh, I thought the, what the uh, Sam and the CSJ, investment to social housing, um, I just wanted to pick up on something. So it's a pet idea of mine. I've got an issue in my constituency. I've got loads of ex-pit villages, uh, many of which are quite small. Uh, they have small amounts of social housing uh, in them, um, usually... 30, 40 homes, small housing estates, similar to one I grew up on, the little ex-council housing estate in East Lancashire. Um, one of the big issues that um, those villages have is that when they were pit villages and they were given D notices in the 1950s, 60s and 70s, um, nobody wanted to live there. Now, they're lovely little rural villages uh, within commuting distance of Teesside, which is seeing massive investment, with the Freeport and investment zones, Durham, which is booming as a small uh, university city with increasing you know, uh, research stuff. Um, and what I'd like to see is the young families being able to buy uh, or rent houses there. Um, I, I'd really like to see what we have at the moment is a restriction uh, on villages under, uh, under 3,000 people uh, in terms of the ability of right to buy and social housing. Uh, I, want, I want those social housing providers to have to sell some of those houses, but also have a responsibility to build small quantities of housing, you know, four, five, six homes a year sometimes, in those villages, which is exactly what those villages... Those villages can be sold on those, on those projects if they're small scale and for people living in the local community. It would also save a load of my rural primary schools, and I'm sure that Guy has a similar issue with his rural primary schools, where young families can no longer afford to live in these small villages. Uh, you know, the social housing is inhabited by retired, you know, people who've lived there forever and stay there into retirement who could easily have bought them, probably, if they were able to do right to buy on them. Um, so I think there's a, it's a small but, I think, important change in the law which could happily accompany some of this stuff, which is a sort of right to buy responsibility to build in a local village, um, you know, with the consent, uh, with, and I think you'd see it with very broadly the consent of local people, if you're looking at s very small-scale developments. What people don't like is when you're in a village of a 1,000 people and suddenly 500 houses are being asked, or two, you know, even, you know, 200 houses that are being asked to be plonked on the side of it. You know, small development, uh, basically in line with what the local population want, I think is a, is a, is a, is a sensible way forward. 
Um, I think we've got time for one more round of questions before we do closing up. The gentleman there have one? No, no. One question there. Okay. Hello, it's Jay Dominey from the Association of British Insurers. Uh, so turning back to the Work and Pensions Committee report from Friday, um, something they talked a lot about is underpensioned groups, and one of those is the self-employed. So just interested to hear the panel's thoughts on how we get the self-employed to save, uh, whether this can be done through the tax system perhaps, or if there's some aspect to inertia there. And also the group in Generation X that sits between automatic enrolment and DB schemes, which some of these reforms to automatic enrolment probably won't help them too much. So also interested in that. How do you get them saved? Richard, do you want to go first this time? Uh, yeah, so on self-employed, uh, this is the, I think there's an important issue here. I think we can probably look at different schemes to encourage them, but I think one of the things is that I, I remember being, I ran a small business which I paid myself out of, and I paid the minimum amount, which meant that I would never hit an auto-enrollment through my business. However, if we reduce the amount which... I was automatically enrolled in, I'd automatically be enrolling myself as a single director into pensions. So I think that wouldn't be a, a sensible way of doing it. Uh, you automatically just drag people who are self-employed into paying their own uh, pensions and then they'll probably invest it in a SIP in themselves. But you know, there's all sorts of things you could do. But it would be, there's, there's, it, that would be a sensible and a quite, quite an easy way of doing it because um, that would just the way that it would, it would knock in. Um, in terms of Generation X. Am I Generation X? I think you're past it, mate. Oh, thanks, <laughs> thanks, What's Guy. What's the age band for Generation <laughs> X? Oh, Guy is Generation X. I'm a millennial, Guy. There Are you, you go. <laughs> hard to believe you're a millennial, but keep going. Uh, there's, there's a, I think the, one of the things I'm particularly keen on doing is that there is, there is a, I, I actually think about genera Generation X is probably um, Deborah, who works in my constituency office, in terms of... Um, uh, pensions. Now, she had 10 years out of actually paying into a pension because she went part-time. Uh, and I think there, is, there are gaps there which need to be filled. And I think pushing that, particularly for female workers, uh, who will often take, uh, or take either time off or go part-time for a period, um, one of the biggest issues that they, you, you see is that suddenly uh, Debs has got a hole in her pension contributions of eight years when she had two kids uh, because she was part-time. And, and I think if she'd been... If she could, have, she could have afforded to pay a small amount, and especially with tax relief during that time, uh, that's why I think these changes, which actually decrease the uh, starting uh, contributions, are so important. Basically, so you get to a point where all you're excluding is temporary jobs. Right, do you want to? Sure. So, I mean, how you fix self-employed, speaking as someone who was a self-employed jockey and then a self-employed barrister for a long period of time, is you get making tax digital, you go and speak to Richard Fuller, still in uh, exhibition, ex ex exhibition room one <laughs> until five past five, I believe, and uh, persuade the Treasury to get a move on on making tax digital. Up utterly transforms it. You have a drop-down box. You have an automated system. It will fix it. I mean, the other bit, like, I mean, there is, with Generation X, automatic enrollment is the way ahead. There's no doubt whatsoever. You can make it easier, though. You can uh, sort of develop uh, particular policies to make that easier. But bluntly, we have to change the savings culture, which is what this is all about. So at the moment, we have a consumption culture and a default product for pensions because successive governments and or the great and the good decided it was only through default savings that we could actually do this. We have to change the way this is with, in terms of the population. All of our parents had savings. Uh, the Generation X do not do savings. We have over 10 million people who don't have 100 pounds saved utterly scandalous, but that ultimately, if you want to change the world, you have to look in a mirror. and We have to make that case for savings. Um, I'm going to uh, ask a quick follow-up question about that, which is how much is that reflective of sort of general intergenerational inequity? A lot of assets are held by much older people. Uh, younger people have much higher marginal tax rates. You know, is, is the lack of savings not so much a reflection of consumption culture, but a reflection of where um, people have things. So um, I disagree manifestly with that. So the best growing businesses, the one I would buy, I think it's called Moneybox or Moneywise, is a very, very cool app on your phone, which when you pay uh, £3.10 for your immensely expensive latte, 
uh, it takes the £1.90 change, or as much as the £6.90 change, and automatically saves it into a savings account, which is then invested really cheaply into an ISA. Uh, most people who have that save over £1,000 in three months. And it's just making savings easy rather than complex and difficult. I've got to set up a bank account. So these sort of companies, uh, Starling and others, are having Barclays and Lloyd's lunch for uh, every single day. They're hoovering up the clients. And their savings, uh, the, the number of savings apps that nowadays, um, so if I put my, stick your hand up if you've got a savings app. Okay. Within five years, everybody will have a savings app. They'll also have a pensions app, but oh, that's a separate issue. Come on, Guy, get on with your pensions app. I'm, I know, don't worry. But it's, so, if I'd said to you 10 years ago, do you have a banking app, none of you would have stuck your hand up. Now, most of you have a banking app. Very shortly, you will all have a savings app, and that savings app will do default savings, which is the way ahead. Okay, I'm going to uh, allow people to give closing remarks now. We've ranged reasonably broadly, so um, what would be great is final remarks on what you think the most important uh, thing the government could do from this discussion today is. And um, Guy, why don't you go first? Uh, make default savings uh, of 1% a thing that Treasury, and I'm not going to go whether it's mandatory or involuntary or whatever, uh, a thing that government gets behind because that will address long-term savings and persuade the FTSE 250 at the very least, and all public sector to offer a 1% savings product. All right, and Richard? Uh, I think the biggest thing it could do is just adopt my private member, <laughs> uh, which gives it the powers to uh, change, the, change, the, change the law and to make the changes which are necessary, and then quickly outline the phased approach to when that's going to be introduced. And Barry, finally. Yeah, I'll take a sponsor's prerogative and, and expand it to three. Uh, first of all, Richard's bill. I think I totally agree. Let's, let's get that enacted. Yeah, 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 of yeah. A, a plan for higher contributions. So yeah, I'm recognizing the cost of living uh, challenge, but let's make sure that we're on a track that everybody understands to a reasonable level of contributions into pensions. And finally, for the Gen X people, for the people for whom it's too late that uh, they they won't benefit sufficiently from the, the track towards higher contributions. I think the government has to push the FCA, hopefully on, a, on an open door, to um, ensure that people get more guidance because the Gen X essentially need help to understand how they're going to cope uh, in retirement with the DC fund. Uh, I, I disagree with Guy. It's not about uh, this generation being more feckless than the last. It's that the last generation found that their employers would pay for their pensions, uh, and partly because the employers had no idea how much the pensions were costing. So the, the, we had a generation, a golden generation, that got DB pensions that cost 20, 20 to 40% of payroll. That's gone, um, but we have to help the generation that missed out understand what they can do to uh, make the best of their retirement. So uh, I'm going to come in very quickly oh, before Richard. No, no, hang on, no, 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 because no, <laughs> only one of us here has actually worked in number ten, and only one of us really ran the show. So I'd like yeah, to know what Richard. your couple of recommendations were. Come on, no, 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 no blushing, crack on. I'll let you get get a think for one minute while Richard comes in with his extra policy. No, the, I, I was actually going to uh, back up something uh, Rachel said against you, Guy, earlier on, which is a little bit about uh, the the. the the, the graduates in this generation, you know, up to around a few years younger than me, who are paying incredibly high marginal rates of tax. Uh, and I do think that um, that is... Jeremy Corbyn in 2019 offered those people a massive tax cut. And uh, I don't think the Conservative Party quite recognises that. And I think we need to have a proper think about how we uh, address that for those people as well, because I think they are paying very high rents and uh, other things, which is probably affecting... We, we passed legislation to raise the tax threshold to over £12,000 over the last 10 years. Yeah, but they're paying 51% marginal rates of tax, you know, if they're earning over 45, 50 grand, aren't they? Or 41% if they're earning what those two guys in the front row are earning. And rent is high. <laughs> Come on, Rachel. All right, we're going to stop there. Guy, I'm never chairing you again. <laughs> don't, you, don't you all want to hear what Rachel thinks? Uh, what does Rachel think? Yeah. Uh, Rachel thinks that um, long-term investment uh, is one of the biggest problems we have as a country. And I think one of the things that makes Richard 
an exceptional MP is the way he is able to consistently link the experiences of his own constituents to policies and background to explain it to those constituents in ways that mean something to them. And I think if we can channel long-term investment in a way that there is a clear local benefit, um, that would be uh, an extraordinary legacy. My, my hope is investment zones take that approach. I fear they are so deregulatory in their beliefs that they will not. There you go. That's what I think, though. Okay. Um, but, moving on from me, uh, thank you so much for the event. Thank you for braving the uh, noise. Thank you to my brilliant uh, panellists and to Royal London for sponsoring the event with Conservative Home. I hope you make it to your Treasury Minister in time, and I hope you have a wonderful conference. Thank you so much. Except to Guy. Thank you. Thank you.